Our second, our second reading is from 2 Samuel 1, verse 1, and um, 17 to 27. After the death of Saul, David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It is written in the book of Jashar. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain. May no showers fall on your terraced fields. For there the shield of the mighty was despised, the shield of Saul, no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we continue our series on the first three kings of Israel. In this chapter, which is 2 Samuel, David hears of the defeat of the army of Israel against their arch enemies, the Philistines. Remember those guys? And he learns of the tragic death of King Saul and Jonathan. David is utterly devastated, and what follows is a heartfelt lament for his King Saul and his friend David. Now, three years ago, we as a church family looked at this passage. We were just coming out of COVID, and we spent time considering what we could learn from David's lament. For those of you who would like to revisit that talk, we will post it on a link on Facebook and Instagram. But today, we want to focus on the fall of King Saul. The question on most people's minds is, how did the reign of King Saul, who was anointed by God, go so horribly wrong? And perhaps more importantly, what can we learn from his fall? Let's remember it was never God's intent that Israel should have a king. However, we heard a few weeks ago, the people of Israel wanted a king, like all the other nations. They wanted a king to lead them into battle, a king to protect them. So God grants them a king. He instructs the prophet, prophet Samuel to anoint Saul as king. But Samuel reminds Israel, you want a king who will rule over you. You chose worldly power over God's power. And he warns them, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if you and your king follow the Lord, 
good. But if you or your king do not follow my commands, my hand will be against you. In the beginning of Saul's reign, we see a man who actually was humble, was filled with the Spirit, and outwardly he looked like the perfect king. Scripture says, an impressive man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than everyone else. Saul proved to be a mighty warrior. He had commendable leadership. And in the early days, Israel experienced great success militarily. Saul was a capable commander, and his popularity grew. All of a sudden, the Israelites began to see Saul as the hope for their nation. Once again, the Israelites looked to a man instead of God for their salvation. And pride began to fill Saul's heart. Pride began to move into Saul's heart and engulf it. Maybe I am as great as they say I am. Maybe I am the long-awaited king. Maybe I can be the one to make this nation great. Saul was no longer humble, and he quickly forgot that it was God that was responsible for the victories. Now, too often, the move from humility to pride is a short step. We find ourselves in situations every day where God blesses our natural talents, our natural abilities supernaturally, and the kingdom is advanced, and there are good results, and we take too much credit for the results. Those of us with not much talent, it's easy to be able to say, that was God, because we don't have the talent. But those of us who have much talent must be very careful to yield to God's leading. If we allow pride to enter our hearts, we may find pride directing our paths. Over my years in pastoral ministry, I've worked very closely with several preachers and teachers. I want to tell you, some were really easy to listen to, and some weren't. Some were great speakers, and you hung on every word. And some, you were looking at your watch, wondering when it would end. I remember working alongside one senior pastor. He was very charismatic. He was a great speaker. And I remember saying to him, you need to be very careful in the pulpit. You are a naturally incredible speaker. Perhaps the best I have ever heard. People could listen to you say anything about anything, and they would be happy and think you're amazing. But you need to make sure you are preaching and teaching as God is leading you. Despite King Saul's early successes, his reign was marked by many willful acts of disobedience. And perhaps the most infamous is recorded in 1 Samuel 13. The prophet Samuel very clearly told Saul days earlier, go to Gilgah, where there is a Philistine outpost, and wait for me. I'll be there in seven days. I will offer sacrifices to God, and we will see what God would have you do. Seven days came. And Samuel was not there yet. The Philistines began to assemble their warriors. Israelites began to scatter. And Saul grew impatient. Where was Samuel? Where was Samuel? I need to do something. He did not wait for the prophet Samuel, and he did the unthinkable. 
he offered sacrifices himself. It's hard to know what Saul was thinking when he offered these sacrifices. Was it that he was trying to please the Israelites around him? Was he afraid of the Philistines? Or was he thinking, I don't need to seek God's advice. After all, I'm king. I know what to do. Let's pause for a minute. Have you ever been in that place? You need to make a big decision. A big decision and you decide that you're not going to seek God's advice. After all, you've been doing pretty good on your own. And you know God pretty well. And you're pretty sure you know what his response will be anyway. So you don't seek his advice. You make a decision without him. Let's be honest. We have all been there. You know, I love hearing when people say things like, I guess God didn't want me to get that job. And I say to them, well, did you pray about it? I wonder how many big, important decisions are made in churches, at council meetings, without prayer, without seeking God's advice. I know that I've been in many meetings where human wisdom was sought before God's advice. And let's face it, when we do ask God to lead us, we often get tired of waiting for his answer. Let's get real. We're waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak to us, but we're impatient. We're impatient because the Holy Spirit seems to work slowly through his people. And then we think, what are we waiting for? We're good people. I know God. I must know what God wants of me. So, we don't wait for God. We allow ourselves to make the decision. We go our own way. We do our own thing. And sadly, and this is a great grief for me, sadly, many of the abuses and scandals we hear about in the North American churches today begin when a rogue leader no longer waits for God's leading and decides to go it on his own. One of my colleagues told me about a senior pastor he had. On his first day, the senior pastor says to him, you know my name is Theo? And he goes, yeah. Well, this is a theocracy. It would be funny if it wasn't true. Theo was king, and whatever he said goes. If he said to jump, he expected his staff to jump. He owned his staff, and he expected them to listen without question. Scary how many leaders there are like that in our church. One of the most important things we need to remember as we think about this act of disobedience is that it landed Saul in the wrong side of power. It's really important to remember that the kingship in Israel was supposed to be different than the kingship everywhere else. The king of Israel was not to be seen as divine, like the kings of other nations. The king was not to be worshipped, like those worshipped kings of other nations. Israel was to separate priesthood from kingship. The king was to have no priestly and no divine prerogatives. Saul's authority was to stay in the military realm. Unfortunately, when Saul offered sacrifices himself, he overstepped his kingship, and he essentially took the place of God, landing on the wrong side of power. Don't miss that. He had no business offering the sacrifices, and he had no business moving without God's leading. One of the other notable disobediences, and there were many, is when it came to Israel's attack of the Amalekites, God said to the armies of Israel, destroy everything, 
take nothing but Saul, knowing better, chose to keep some of the spoils of war for himself. He didn't think he was doing anything wrong. After all, he mostly obeyed God. Well, then, <laughs> when Samuel approaches him about this, he thinks fast on his feet and he says, well, I brought back the best so I could sacrifice them to the Lord. Nice try, Saul. God saw right through that. God was not interested in a king who gave him burnt offerings but did not obey him. God was not interested in a king who was big and impressive and great in the eyes of people. God wanted a king that was obedient, a king that would remain in his lane, a king that wanted to please God, a king who would allow God to lead him. But it was obvious that Saul was not going to be that king. Imagine how different this story would be if Saul had admitted his sin, his shortcomings, and developed a humble and submissive heart. Pride might not have taken over, and the story of the Israelites might have been completely different. But unfortunately, Saul was spiritually blind to the fact that he had sinned greatly against God. So we read in 1 Samuel 15.35, And the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king. As a result, God sought another king to eventually replace Saul. So in the latter years, you remember that David was secretly anointed, David was experiencing success in battles. We heard of David and Goliath. And Saul's grip on the throne was slipping. He was getting agitated. His pride and his jealousy engulfed him. And then, instead of focusing on what he should have been focusing on, which is Israel and the enemies around him, he spent years trying to kill David. And consequently, the Philistines took advantage of this weakness. And as we heard, at Mount Gilboa, they warred against the Israelites, caused defeat, and brought the eventual death of Saul and Jonathan. As I reflect on the fall of King Saul, I am struck by how strong a King Saul was in the beginning. But Saul's story reminds us that it doesn't matter how we start, it's how we finish. His initial faith and trust in God were replaced by pride, jealousy, fear, and selfish ambition. Any one of us may begin this journey of faith well, but how can we finish it well? Let me give you three thoughts. Number one, Keep God at the center of your life. Do not take your eyes off him. Don't worry about the world is saying you should do. Worry about what God is calling you to do. Do not be distracted by how the world sees you. And don't let pride take control of your heart. Number two. Do not forget what God has done for you in the past. It's always about God and what he's done through you. It's never about you and what you have done. Remember that. God is building his kingdom on earth, not you. Number three, humbly submit and obey God with all your heart. And when you fail God's call, when you fail to heed his leading, as you might at time to time, come clean. Recognize your sin. Confess it to God and ask for forgiveness. Don't deflect the blame. Don't put it on others. Own your sin and let God deal with it. Number four, this one I find the hardest. Trust God's timing and directions. 
For some of us, this is the hardest. We want to take control of our lives and make all the decisions. We become impatient. We want the answers now. We want to God to speak immediately, but sometimes he doesn't. And we must wait. We must remember in the waiting that God is good, that he loves us unconditionally, and that we can trust him. His timing is perfect. And his directions and plans are sufficient for whatever we're going through. And we don't need to understand them. We just need to trust God is in control. We just need to trust that God knows what he is doing, and he knows us, and he knows what he is asking us to do. Let us pray. Holy God, help us to start and finish our faith journey well. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on your son, Jesus. Help us to ignore the distractions of the world. Remind us daily of how much you have done for us and how much you love us. Help us to hear the Spirit's leading and help us to submit to your will and your ways. And lastly, Lord, help us to trust in your timing and your direction, even when we don't understand them or even like them. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.